Happy 4th of July, ladies and gentlemen, we have a very special Independence Day show for you at Silver City Community Theater Radio Hour here on Gila Membris Community Radio, KURU 89.1 FM and online at GMCR. I'm Wendy Spurgeon, your hostess here with weekly radio theater entertainment meticulously edited by Chris Wellman of Mystic Way Productions and featuring the fresh, feisty, locally sourced talent of Silver City Community Theater and beyond. Season 1, Episode 10, SCCT Radio Hour presents Happy Independence Day! Today... We invite you to enjoy the story of Paul Revere like you have never heard it before, followed by the drama and intrigue of Lydia Dara, Patriot. Columbia Workshop originally aired Paul Revere on May 16, 1937, and we are pleased to present our homage to this fresh and funny take on the story of Paul Revere as a long and lazy yarn for you to enjoy with some iced tea or watermelon with your friends and family on this warm summer day. And we welcome back Dan Jameson as our announcer and man one. Mel Gelb takes the lead as our old man, a storyteller and rural New Englander. Marley Convery Morales plays the girl, his granddaughter. The title role, Paul Revere, is wittingly portrayed by one of our newer company members, Billy Dominguez. And we are proud to introduce Zen Timmons as William, his assistant, a boy working as uh, for Revere. And we've got Phyllis McQuaid plays Floribel, a snob. Sarah Thrasher plays a chatty mother. William Knutin and pops in as man too, and Jim McQuaid takes on Lige Butterwick, a rural New Englander. Now you may think you know the story of Paul Revere, but I promise you've never heard it like this before. We are proud to kick off our 4th of July show with Paul Revere. gentlemen, the Columbia Workshop, under the direction of Irving Rice, presents as its 40th program, Paul Revere, an original play for radio by Stephen Vincent Bennett. One of America's outstanding poets and writers, Stephen Vincent Bennett is especially remembered for his epic poem, John Brown's Body, which was awarded the Pulitzer Prize in 1928. Students of radio believe that it is giving rebirth to the lost art of the storyteller. And it is significant that in writing his first work for the medium, Mr. Bennett uses his device to tell us in prose a charming legend of the American Revolution. The Columbia Workshop is proud to present Stephen Vincent Bennett's first original play for radio, Paul Revere, featuring Parker Fennell in a lead role. Well, this is what I call solid comfort. Sitting in front of a fire with your family when your work's done for the day. How are you, granddaughter? Oh, fine, grandfather. I've got about a million questions to ask you. Well, we'll take up the first 100,000 or so. Well, first, there's a math problem, but I don't think we'll do that. Why not? Well, of course, you're awfully clever, grandfather. But this is about those three people digging a ditch, A, B, and C. Oh, yeah. I know them. And A digs twice as fast as B. Yeah, he always did, to the best of my recollection. I wish I could hire that feller A to work on our place. He'd have the Panama Canal dug in less time than it takes me to grab a shovel. But C digs only a quarter fast as B. Yeah, I know C, too. 
Anytime I get a man to chop wood, it always turns out to be C. Well, now, I'd love to do that problem for you. I, I just love it. But ain't you studying anything else at that school of yours? Oh, of course, Grandfather. Chemistry and French and choral and group coordination. Oh, dear. And American history. Hmm. That, that's, that's good. Why? Do you know about American history, Grandfather? Well, I can't say I know so much about the dates and such, but there are some stories I used to know. Ah, shucks. I guess you wouldn't call them history, though. What kind of stories, Grandfather? Well, you see, there was an old feller in town when I was a boy. Used to sit out in front of the store in the cool of the evening and tell stories. We'd all gather around and listen. Hmm. We used to call him the oldest inhabitant. And I collect he was, too. I tell you, there wasn't a character that you could mention that he couldn't tell you something about. Something that wasn't in the books much. Of course, it was legends and tall stories. They weren't true? Well, they weren't. And yet again, they was. Now, you take the history story he tell about Paul Revere, for instance. Oh, I know all about Paul Revere. He wrote to Lexington and Concord and said, the British are coming. Longfellow wrote a poem about him. And they hung out lanterns in the Old North Church and said, one if by land and two if by sea. And he was silversmith too. Mm, yeah, that's all right. Except that Paul Revere never got to Concord. Though he did warn the folks in Lexington. And the lanterns weren't lit for him. He started from the Boston side. But the way my old feller told it, the whole thing was mixed up with a fellow called Lige Butterwick and his tooth. His tooth? Yep. Mm-hmm. Well, what did someone else's tooth have to do with Paul Revere's ride? Well, Paul Revere, you know, was kind of a jack of all trades and silversmithing, that wasn't all that he'd done. Oh, shucks, I don't know if there's any truth in this story, but there's this much truth. There's this much. Anyway, you have something stirring happen like a revolution, and there's a lot of just ordinary folks around that don't know just what's happening until after it's happened. You remember that when you read history. I will. Yeah, there's the heroes and the clever folks. Then there's a million Lige Butterwicks that can't make head or tail of things. They just go around living and dying through all the cataclysms and the earthquakes. Now this is the way I used to hear the story about him told. There was a feller called Lige Butterwick, lived about five miles from Lexington, Massachusetts. That was just before the American Revolution broke loose. And what with one thing and another, time was boiling and seething. But Lige Butterwick, he worked his farm and he didn't pay much attention. Well, everything went along for him the way that it does for most folk. Until one April morning in 1775, he waked up with a toothache. Being New England, he didn't pay much attention to it at first. He'd never had no trouble with his teeth before. But he mentioned it that evening at supper time, and his wife, she got a bag of hot salt for him. Hot salt? Hot salt. He held it up to his face, and it seemed to ease him, but he couldn't hold it there all night, of course. And next morning, the tooth hurt worse than ever. So finally, he took the horse. He rode it into Lexington town to have it seen to. Well, when he got to Lexington, he noticed that the people there seemed kind of excited. There was a lot of talk about muskets and powder and about a couple of men called Hancock and Adams that was staying at Parson Clark's. But he didn't pay much attention. He set right out for the horse doctor as being the likeliest man he knew to pull a tooth. Well, the horse doctor, he took one look at it and he shook his head. I can pull her, Lige, she says. I can pull her all right. But she's got deep roots and she got strong roots and she's gonna leave an awful hole when she's gone. 
Now what you really need, though it's taken away my business, of course, he said, is one of these here artificial teeth to go in that hole. Artificial teeth, says Lige? Where in Tunket am I going to get one of them in a town like Lexington? Well, you'll have to go to Boston for it, says the horse doctor. And he sighed. For he was kind of a gloomy man, you know. He says, there's a fellow called Revere that fixes them there. They say he's a boss workman. Well, gracious, it's something I hadn't thought of, says Lige. But that tooth's got to come out before I go stark staring crazy. And if Revere's the man, he's the man. So I'll just take that prospectus of his you got there and I'll go to him. I've wasted the morning already. Might just as well waste the rest of the day. So he gets on his horse again and starts out for Boston. And going by Parson Clark's, he sees two men talking in the Parson's front room. Now, one is a tallish, handsomish man in pretty fine clothes, and the other one's shorter and untidy with a, well, kind of a bulldog face. But he don't pay much attention to them. He just rides ahead to Boston. He comes to get his tooth fixed, and being New England, he meant to do it. Well, when he got there, he stopped in a tavern for a bite and a supper. Of course, it was a long past his dinner time, and it seemed to him the things there were even more curious. Nice weather we're having these days, he says, in kind of a friendly way to the barkeep. It's bitter weather for Boston, says the barkeep in an unfriendly voice, and a low kind of growl goes up at that from the boys in the back room. Well, of course, that doesn't help Lige's toothache none, but being a sociable feller, he keeps on. He says, maybe for Boston, he says, but out in the country, we call it good planting weather. The barkeep, he just stares at him hard. I guess I was mistaken in you, he says. It is good planting weather for some kind of trees. And what kind of trees was you thinking of, says a sharp-faced man that lies his left and squeezes his shoulder. There's trees and trees, you know, says a red-faced man that lies his right and gives him a dig in the ribs. Well, now that you ask me, says Lige, but he can't even finish before that red-faced man, he digs him in the ribs again. The Liberty Tree, says the red-faced man, and may it soon be watered in the blood of tyrants. True blue Britons and hearts of oak, says the sharp-faced man, and God save King George and loyalty. And with that, it seemed to Lige Butterwick that the whole tavern kind of riz up at him. (gasps) Yeah, he was kicked pummeled and mauled and thrown in a corner, then yanked out again with the red-faced man and the sharp-faced man square dancing over his prostate form. Finally, he finds himself right out in the street with half of his coat gone galley west. Well, says Lige to himself, I always heard city folks crazy. Now I know it. And to think of a fight like that starting over trees, Then, you know, he noticed that sharp-faced man was alongside of him trying to shake his hand. And the sharp-faced man had the beginnings of a beautiful black eye. Nobly done, friend, said the sharp-faced man. And I'm glad to find another true-hearted loyalist in this pestilent, rebellious city. Well, I take them expressions very kind, says Lige Butterworth but I take it even kinder if you tell me what this is all about. The sharp-faced man, he looked at him. Brother, he says kind of mournfully, brother, you can't be as stupid as you look. It ain't in nature. Tell me, where do you hail from? Why, out Lexington way, says Lige, perfectly truthful, you know. And he says, I'm looking for a fella called Paul Revere. 
Paul Revere, said the sharp-faced man, just as if that name had bit him. And then he began to smile. Twasn't a pleasant smile. Oh, it's Paul Revere you want, says he. Well, I'll tell you how to find him. You go up to the first British soldier you see, and you ask the way. He'll tell you. But, he says, you better give the password first. Password, says Lange. Yeah, says the sharp-faced man. You just say to that British soldier, any lobsters for sale today? Lobsters? Lobsters. And then you ask for Mr. Revere. Well, why do I ask about lobsters, says Lige Butterworth. Well, you see, the sharp-faced man says, the British soldiers, they wear red coats, so they like being asked about lobsters. You try it and see. Then he went away with his shoulders shaken. Hmm. Well, that seemed awful queer to Lige Butterworth but no queerer than the other things that had happened so far. So he looked for a British patrol and he found it and he stepped up to them just as bold as brass. I beg your pardon, he says, but could you tell me? Oh, and then he remembered the password. Oh, he says, are any lobsters for sale today? Well, sir, no sooner was the words out of his mouth. Then them soldiers took after him and they chased him clear down to the wharf before he could get away. Gee. Yep. At that, he only managed it by hiding in an empty tar barrel. And when he got that, <laughs> he was certainly a sight for sore eyes. Well, I guess that couldn't have been the right password, he says to himself as he tried to rub off some of the tar with his handkerchief says, these city people can't make a fool out of me, though. I come here to get my tooth fixed and get it fixed, I will. And just then, mind you, he sees a sign on a shop at this end of the wharf. And the sign says, er, P. Revere, Silversmith. And under it, in small letters, it says, large and small bells cast to order, engraving and printing done in job lots, artificial teeth sculptured and copper boilers mended all branches of goldsmith and silversmith work and revolutions put up to take out express service tuesdays and fridays to lexington concord and points west well sir says lies butterworth to himself now maybe i can get my tooth fixed and he marched right up to the door paul revere he was sitting behind the counter, putting the final polish on a silver bowl. A man of, oh, 40 odd he was, with a quick keen face, you know, and snapping eyes. He was wearing American clothes, all right, but there was um, a French look about him. Well, of course, his father was Napoleus Rivare, you know, from the island of Guernsey and from French uh, Huguenot stock but they changed the name to Revere when they came to Boston. Now, it wasn't such a terrible big shop, but it had silver pieces in it that people had paid thousands for since. Well, there was quite a few customers when Lige Butterwick first came in, so he hung back for a while, and the talk he heard went something like this. Mr. Revere, I'm so disappointed, so terribly disappointed. Disappointed, madam? Yes, in my new silver service. You sent it back yesterday, and when I took it out of the box, I could have cried. Oh, it is I who am disappointed, madam. Well, what is the matter? It must have been carelessly packed. I will speak to my boy. Was it badly dented? Oh, no, no, it wasn't dented. But I wanted a really impressive silver service. I certainly paid for the best. For the best? I have given you the best work of which Paul Revere is capable, madam. It was in my hands for six months, and I think they are skillful hands. Oh, I know you're a competent artisan, Mr. Revere. Artisan, madam. Artisan? I am a silversmith and the son of a silversmith. 
to be that is to be an artist. Well, I don't know about artists, but I know I wanted a real silver service, something I could show to my friends. And what have you given me? Oh, I don't say that it isn't good silver, but it's as plain and simple as, as a, a picket fence. I hope so, madam. You hope so? Hoity toity, you hope so? Just one minute, madam. I must speak to Mr. Revere. Well. Mr. Revere, these last engravings of the Boston Massacre are selling like hotcakes. Can you give me 25 for my New York correspondence? I've had at least a dozen inquiries. My boy will find them for you. William. Yes, master? See if we have 25 massacres for this gentleman. If we haven't, I must run off a new batch tonight. You better look at the plate too, William. Yes, master. <clears throat> now, madam, you were saying? Saying? I was saying I was never so insulted in my life. Why, there isn't even as much as a lion and a unicorn on the cream jug. And I told you I wanted the sugar bowl covered with silver grapes. There will be no lions or unicorns on any of my silver, madam. And as for those pot-bellied sugar bowls crawling with fruit and ribbons, grand dear de dear, I am a silversmith, not a milliner. Oh. Mr. Revere. <clears throat> Excuse me, madam. Yes? Sons of Liberty, powder, all ready, keeping watch. Tell them to wait for the signal and the sexton of North Church. Right. Adams and Liberty. Adams and Liberty. <clears throat> now, madam, you were saying? I was saying that I am completely... Oh, Mr. Revere, what's the price of this silver rattle? 25 shillings, madam. Genuine coral. 25 shillings? 25 shill... Oh, well, it's rather sweet, but 25 shillings? Tell me, is it guaranteed, Mr. Revere? Ah, uh, against normal efforts of normal infants, madam, yes. But I've heard tales of your boy, madam. An infant, Hercules. I don't know if I really could venture to guess. Yes, Jack is really very strong for his age. Do you know what he did the other day? He... As a special concession, 23 shillings, madam. And a guarantee for, for three months? Yes, all right. I'll take it. Wrap it up for the lady, William. Yes, master. <clears throat> and now, madam, what can I do for you today? What can you do for me today? You have done it, Mr. Revere. It has been done, I tell you. I am sending your hideous silver back tomorrow. Not an ornament on it. Not so much as a vine leaf. All as plain and simple and bare as the hills and rocks of New England. And I'm to set that before my friends? Not while my name is Flora Bell Carpenter and I'm an English woman. Madam. <gasps> Good day, madam. Good day, William. What? The fellow's bowing to me as if I paid him a compliment. You have plain, simple, bare as the hills and rocks of New England, graceful as the bows of her elm trees. Ah, if my silver were only like that indeed. That is what I wish to make it. What? As for you, madam. What? With your lions and unicorns and grapevines and all of your nonsense of bad ornaments done by bad silversmiths. Why, why, Mr. Revere, don't you dare. Take your hands off me. Mercy. And your imported bad taste and your imported British manners. Why, he's actually putting me out of the door. <laughs> she's, she's scuttling away like an angry turkey. <laughs> oh, oh, alack. And I work four months on her service. And who's to pay for it now? But she shouldn't have insulted my silver. William. Yes, master. Never lose your temper, William. Never. That's a very bad practice. Yes, master. Mine's French, you see. That, that makes a difference. And William? Yes, master? Never argue with the customer. How often have I told you that, William? Almost every day, master. And uh, how often do I argue with customers? Almost every day, master. I was afraid so. And yet, yet can't they see that silver ought to be beautiful in the shape itself? 
not the ornament. Can't they see we're making new things in this country? New silver, new ideas, perhaps, perhaps a new nation, a new design? Ah, oh, well, be off with you, William, and put up the shutters. What clothes for the day? Is there any message from Dr. Warren? No, Master. Not yet. And Hancock and Adams still at Lexington, and the Red Coat regulars disembarking from the ship. I wish I had sure news, but we must wait until we're sure to warn them. Ah, but waiting's a weary business. Please, Master? Yes, William? Well, 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 will they hang Mr. Hancock and Mr. Adams if they catch them? They might, William, they might. But let's hope some good friend will warn Hancock and Adams first. Yes, Master. But, Master? Yes, William. Suppose you warn them. Master, would they hang you then? They'd have to catch me first, William. By the way, are my riding boots clean? Yes, Master. And Mrs. Revere says that the next time you ride to Lexington, will you take a box of liniment along and be sure to rub yourself with it when you get there? She says it's a muddy road, and she doesn't want to have you around the house with sciatica if she can help it. <laughs> Thank you, William. But I'll take something more important than liniment with me if I have a ride to Lexington. Well, we'll lock up now. Yes, sir. But I, I'm still here. Great Adams and Liberty, where, where did you come from, my friend? Did you spring up out of the ground? No, Mr. Revere. It is Mr. Revere, ain't it? I think it is. Yay, I... I just sat down for a rest while you was busy with your customers, mm -hmm. and my tooth stopped hurting. So I must have dozed off. Anyhow, now... Well, my friend, I'm very sorry, but it's after hours. I'll have to ask you to come back in the morning. Oh, no. Can't wait till the morning. Horse doctor told me so. Well, what won't wait until morning? My tooth. Your tooth? Yep. What in heaven's name... You don't talk like a Boston man. Where do you come from? Oh, right on Lexington Way. See this tooth? Where? Where? Lexington, I said. Can't you hear me? This here tooth of mine. Lexington, were you there this morning? Of course I was. That's when I met the horse doctor. Never mind the horse doctor. Were Mr. Hancock and Mr. Adams still at Parson Clark's? Who? Who? Great heavens! Is there a man in the American colonies who doesn't know Mr. Hancock and Mr. Adams? Were there two men? Two men, I tell you, strangers, staying at Parson Clark's. Well, as I rode past the parsonage... Yes, yes, yes? Seems to me there was two strangers there. Oh! Uh, a handsome kind of a man, in pretty good clothes. Uh-huh. And another fellow... Looked, uh, kind of like a bulldog. Hancock and Adams. Though Adams won't thank you for the description. So they're still there. Now listen, as you came to my shop, did you pass any redcoats? No, I, I didn't pass them. Four of them chased me into a tar barrel. Yes, yes, that's just the ordinary patrol anymore. Uh, why? Seemed to me as I went by, there was a whole parcel of them going toward the end of the common. They had flags and swords. As I thought, they must be getting ready to march. Thank you, my friend. You've done me and the colonies an invaluable service. And now, if you'll excuse me. Hey, wait, wait. You can't run off like that. What about my tooth here? I came all the way from Lexington to have you fix it. Here's your professor's. It says, just plain as print, see? Yes, yes, but can't you understand? I do fix artificial teeth, but as for drying real ones, well, I have done it once or twice, but it's hardly my trade. Oh, well, open your mouth and I'll have a look. Uh, wider. Uh, Still wider? Man, you have a jaw like an alligator. Do you feel that? Do I feel it? Who wouldn't feel it? Ow! Hmm, you may shut your mouth again. Is it very bad, Mr. Revere? It's a compound agglutinated mesotropic infraction of the upper molar. Oh, my glory. There's no use at all in trying to pull it tonight. Now, what the thing for you to do is uh, go to a tavern, get a good night's rest, and come back to me in the morning. And meanwhile, I'll give you, I'll give you William. Yes, Master? Where's that liniment of Mrs. Revere's? In the black chest, Master. Good. I'll give you some liniment, and if the tooth hurts, you use it. Now, 
Now, let's see. That certainly is a handsome chest, Mr. Revere. Yes, I keep some queer things in that chest. You see, silversmithing isn't my only trade. What's this little bottle here? Oh, that's a little experiment of mine. I call it Essence of Boston. There's a good deal of East Wind in it. East Wind? Shut up in a butt. Say, are you a magician? Oh, no, not exactly. But with one thing and another one, I kind of like to keep my hand in. Here's some charms against love. Not very durable. I got them from a sailor. And here in this little box. My, that's a pretty one. I'm glad you like it. It's my own design. Can you make out the figures on it? Hmm. Seems like there's a tree. Yes, a liberty tree. And an eagle fighting a lion. The British lion. Yeah? What's all these stars around the edge? 10, 11, 12, 13 of them. Oh, that was just my fancy. You, you could make a very pretty design with the stars for a new country if you wanted to. I've sometimes thought of it. The American Revolution. Handle with care and keep in a cool place. Mm. Say, it feels kind of warm when you touch it. Yeah, it might well. You see, there's, there's something inside that box. Gunpowder? Gunpowder. And war. And the making of a new nation. And if it ever got loose. Here. Here. Take it back. I don't want it. A lot of people don't want it, but it's coming. Only it isn't quite time yet. No, not quite yet. You know, I, I, feel, I feel kind of faint. I guess I'll sit down here. All right now. I'll give you the liniment. Master. Yes? A message from Dr. Warren. At last. Oh, I must go. Get my riding boots. Yes, Master. What about me? Here, take the box. Take the box and be off with you. There, in your pocket. Hurry. William, let him out. Yes, Master. Well, Mr. Revere, I don't know how I'll go without having my tooth pulled. Hurry, man, hurry. Come back in the morning and I'll attend to you then. Now, William, tell Mrs. Revere I may be away all night, but she's not to worry. I'll return as soon as I can. Yes, Master. William, William. Yes, Master. The liniment, you fool, the liniment. Oh, I gave him the wrong box. Great Adams and Liberty, he's got the American Revolution with him. And so, according to the tale, Lige Butterwick went back to his tavern with the American Revolution in his pocket. Seems that Revere and William run after him and called after him, but it was dark by the wharves and they missed him somehow. Oh, what did he do with the revolution, Grandfather? <laughs> well, now, it's a considerable job being a custodian of a revolution, even when it's shut up in a silver box. Sure. And it wasn't no time at all that the Lige Butterwick had gone to bed before he began to feel creepy. He tossed and he turned and he turned to where his clothes lay on the chair. His tooth had kind of settled down to a dull ache by now and he didn't mind that much no more. But he minded this new feeling, oh, something extraordinary, till finally he got up in the moonlight and he went over to his coat and shook it. And he reached his hand in his pocket, and he pulled out that silver box. Ooh. Well, sir, at first he was so frustrated he didn't know what to do. But being human, he was curious. He shook the box, and he handled it, and just seemed to make it warmer. So he soon gave that up. Then he looked all over for a keyhole, but there wasn't no keyhole, and of course, if there had been, he didn't have no key. Then he put his ear to the box and he listened hard. And it seemed to him that he heard very tiny and far away inside that box, the rolling fire of thousands of tiny muskets and the tiny far away cheers of many men. 
Oh. Hold your fire, he heard a voice say. Don't fire till you're fired on. But if they want a war, let it begin here. And then there was a rolling of trumpets and a squeal of fights. It was small, still, and far away, but it made him shake all over. For he knew that he was listening to something in the future and something that he didn't have no right to hear. He sat down on the edge of the bed with that box in his hands. What am I going to do with this? He says to himself, it's too big a job for one man. Well, he thought kind of scared like of going down to the river and throwing the box in there. But when he thought of doing it, he knew he couldn't. Then he thought of his farm out near Lexington and the peaceful days. Once the revolution was out of that box, there'd be an end to that. And that made him want to get rid of that box more than ever. Then he remembered what Revere had said when he was talking with the woman about the silver. That thing about building a new country and building a clean and plain. Why, I ain't a Britisher, he thought. I'm a New Englander. And maybe there's something beyond that. Something people like Hancock and Adams know about. And if it has to come with the revolution, well, I guess it has to come. We can't stay Britishers forever here in this country. He listened to the box again. Now, there wasn't any shooting in it, just a queer tune played on a fife. He didn't know the name of that tune, but it lifted his heart. He got up sort of slow and heavy. I guess I'll have to take this back to Paul Revere, he said. Well, first place he went was Dr. Warren's, having heard Revere mention it. But he didn't get much satisfaction there. It took him quite a while to convince them that he wasn't a spy. And when he finally did, all they'd tell him was Revere had gone over to the river to Charleston. And so he went down to the waterfront looking for a boat. And the first person he met was a very angry woman. An angry woman? No, she says. You don't get no boats from me. There was a crazy man along here an hour or so ago, and he wanted a boat too. And my husband was crazy enough to take him. And then do you know what he'd done, she says? No, ma'am, I, I don't know, says Lige Butterworth. Why, he'd take my best petticoat, muffle the oars with, so they wouldn't make a splash when they went past the British ships, he says, pointing out to where the man of war Somerset lay at anchor. My best petticoat, I tell you, she says. And when my husband comes back here, he's going to get a piece of my mind. Was his name Revere, says Lige Butterwick? And was he a man of 40-odd, keen-looking, and kind of Frenchy? I don't know what his right name is, she says. But his name is just mud with me. My best petticoat swimming in that nasty river. And that's all he could get out of her. All the same, he managed to get a boat at last. The story don't say how. And row across the river. Well, the tide was a young flood and the moonlight bright on the water. And he passed right under the shadow of the Somerset, right where Revere had passed. And when he got to the Charleston side, he could see the lanterns in North Church. Though, of course, he didn't know what they were. Then he told the folks at Charlestown he was after Revere. They got him a horse, and so he started to ride. And all the while, that silver box was just a burning in his pocket. Ooh. Yep. Well, he lost his way, more or less, I guess, as he well might in the darkness. And it was dawn when he come into Lexington by a side road. Now, that dawn in that country is pretty 
with the dew still on the grass, you know. But he wasn't looking at the dawn. He was feeling that box burn his pocket and thinking hard. Then all of a sudden, he reins up his tired horse. For there, on the side of the road, were two men carrying a trunk. And one of them men was Paul Revere. Oh. Yep, Paul Revere. They looked at each other, and Lige begins to grin. For Revere was just as dirty and mud-splashed as he was himself. He'd warned Hancock, mind you, and he'd warned Adams all right. But then, on his way to Concord, he got catched up by the British and turned loose again. So he'd gone back to Lexington to see how things was there. And now he and this other fellow were saving a trunk of papers that Hancock had left behind so they wouldn't fall into the hands of the British. Well, Mr. Revere, says Lige, you see, I'm on time for that little appointment about my tooth. And by the way, he says, I've got something for you. And he takes that silver box out of his pocket. And then he looks over towards Lexington Green, and he catches his breath. For there on the green, there's a little line of Minutemen, neighbors of his, as he knows, and in front of them, the British regulars. British regulars? British regulars. And even as he looks, there's the sound of a gunshot, and suddenly smoke wraps the front of the British line, and he hears them shout as they run forward. Oh. Well, sir, Lige Butterwick, he takes that silver box and stamps on it with his heel. And with that, the box breaks open. And there's a dazzle in his eyes for a moment and a noise of men shouting. And then it's gone. Do you know what you've done, says Revere, breathing deep? You've let out the American Revolution. Gee. Well, says Lige Butterwick, I guess t'was about time. And I guess I'd better be going home now. I've got a gun on the wall there, and I'll need it. But what about your tooth, says Paul Revere. Oh, a tooth is a tooth, says Lige Butterwick. But a country is a country. And anyhow, it stopped aching. Yep, all the same. They say that Paul Revere made a silver tooth for him after the war. At least, that's the way they tell it. Of course, I would vouch for it. You've heard is the 40th program in the Columbia Workshop series, Paul Revere, an original play written especially for radio by Stephen Vincent Bennett. Parker Fennelly was featured in the role of the storyteller. Edgar Staley played Paul Revere. The workshop programs are arranged and directed by Irving Rice. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Happy Independence Day from Silver City Community Theater Radio Hour. If you're just tuning in, that was the tall tale of Paul Revere right here on Gila Membrus Community Radio on KURU 89.1 FM and online at gmcr.org, a voice and a choice for Southwest New Mexico. Next up, we have another American revolutionary hero. It's Lydia Dara, Patriot. Now, this story comes to us courtesy of station KYW, the Suburban School Hour. It originally broadcast on February 24th, 1947. We give thanks for the published version of the script by Paul T. Gant in Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania History, Volume 14, Number 4, October 1947, pages 280 to 288. Now, our narrator is Phyllis McQuaid, and we welcome back Ella Jameson as Susanna Dara, age nine. In the role of Anne Dara, age 21, we have Sarah Thrasher, 
And, oh, we introduce Theodore Beltron as uh, William Dara Jr., aged 11. William Knutnen plays William Dara Sr. And uh, we are lucky to have Zen Bag, Zen Timmons, plays John Dara, age 15. And we've got Shelly Chase takes on the role of Lydia Dara, our, ti our title role there. Dan Jameson pops back in as our British officer. Billy Dominguez comes back as our British officer, our British soldier, rather. And Jim McQuaid plays the voice and Colonel Craig. And special thanks to our magical audio engineer, Chris Wellman of Mystic Way Productions for making these radio shows possible. We literally could not do this show without you. So thank you and happy 4th of July, Chris. We at SCCT Radio Hour are excited to present Lydia Dara, Patriot. It was the bitter winter of 1777. While Washington and his men shivered at Valley Forge, the British were comfortable in Philadelphia. They had ordered William Dara to give them the use of his house located on 2nd Street. But Lydia, his wife, objected. She went to General Howe in his headquarters. Her husband and children anxiously awaited her return. What will the British do to Mother Anne? Nothing, Sue, dear. It's just our home they want. We won't have any place to sleep. Will they take our clothes too, Father? Of course not. We'll just have to take what we can and find some other house. Maybe they'll send us out to Cousin John's place in the country beyond Rising Sun. I'll bet he'll be surprised when we arrive with a military escort. Cousin John has enough troubles of his own without us, William. John, come away from that window and sit quietly over here. But Father, I want to see Mother come out of General Howe's house. I know she will walk straight as an Indian between her guards. I don't think there will be any guards, John. Mother is a very determined person, and I have a feeling that even General Howe will not chase her out of her house. Wait, everybody. The door is opening. Here comes a soldier, and there's Mother. Oh, she is crossing the street alone. William, go and open the door for your mother. You must have made the old general do just as she wanted. Oh, Mother, are the British going to make us go away? Uh, are we going to be refugees, Mother? Quiet, children, quiet. We're going to keep our house. Oh, I was sure we would have to go away with a military escort. John said we would. I don't think we will have a military escort, but some of us will have to go away. You children are to go to live with Cousin John. Anne and your father and I may remain here. Lydia, why send the children? Why don't we all go? The children only, William. That is the way it is arranged. A very strange arrangement. Is this another plan that you... Wait, William. Anne, will you take the children to their rooms and help them pack the clothes and other things they will need? Don't take more than necessary. Can we go today, Mother? Hurry, Anne. I know just what to take. You help me first. Mother, can you make them give us an escort? Just imagine what Cousin John would... William. We will do without the escort, and we will do without any nonsense from you. Run and get ready. John, help him. Mother, could I possibly stay here with you? Maybe I could help if, if there is something. You can help by taking care of your brother and sister. Yes, Mother. But with Charles out there at White Marsh with General Washington, I thought that maybe I could help here. Your brother Charles would think that you can help by doing what I say. Now go and pack and help William. This is not so simple as it sounds, Lydia, I'm sure. What plan is in your mind? I have no plan yet, William. I persuaded General Howe that we simply could not find any place where all of us could go. I promised to send the children away so that he and his staff could use the large room upstairs for a conference room. We will have our own rooms. But why send the children away? We could have made room for them. It is better for them this way. The general gave me a pass, which I can use to visit them. That was all I asked for. A pass through the lines. Hmm. I begin to see what you have in mind. 
I am afraid I won't allow it, Lydia. You should leave these things to me. But William, our son Charles is out there with our troops at White Marsh. Anything I can do to help him is my duty. You can get bits of news and send them out with messengers as before. That is your duty. But something big is in the making, and you are not apt to discover that in the town. It will be decided in the secrecy of the council chamber. A council which will meet in our own house behind closed doors and between four walls. One wall of which, my dear, adjoins my own bedchamber, where there is a closet with a very thin partition. Let's not discuss it anymore. When more than one person has a secret, it ceases to be a secret. The British held councils frequently in the upper chamber. Nothing unusual occurred to disturb the Dara family. The severe winter reduced military operations to a minimum. Then, on Tuesday, December 2nd, a British officer came to see Lydia. Madam Dara, tonight we wish to hold a council meeting in the upper room. You will have the fire going and everything in readiness. Yes, sir. The room is ready at all times. And you will make certain that there are no visitors in the house tonight. That will be easy. No one visits us since you are using our house. One thing more. You will see to it that the members of your family retire to their rooms at an early hour and remain there for the night. We will notify you when to lock up the house. Everything will be as you ask. If it is not, I can assure you that there will be considerable trouble for everyone. Good day. The time has come. This is what I've waited for. Nothing must go wrong. Good evening, madam. The room is ready? This way, gentlemen. It is warm and there is extra wood. Do you wish anything else? This seems fine. Has your family retired? Good. Then you will do the same. We shall waken you when we leave. They are all in now. The last man locked the door. Now the meeting will begin. I must be in my night clothes in case a check is made. And now, the closet, quietly. Gentlemen, the council will be in order. The enemy shows no knowledge of our preparations. And so, gentlemen, the troops will march out in the late evening of December the 4th. The attack will be directly on the forces of Washington at White Marsh. With the enemy unprepared, our victory is certain. The conference is over. They're going now. Y yes? What is it? Just a minute. I'm sorry to have to wake you, madam. You may lock the outer door now. Thank you. I shall attend to it at once. Lydia Dara slept very little that night. She must get word to General Washington at once. But the British would be alert for any strange action. She discarded plan after plan. By the next afternoon, she had decided what to do. But Anne, it has been a long time since we had any news of the children. General Howe gave me the pass for my own use. And tomorrow morning, I'm going to make the trip. Mother, this is sheer nonsense. The weather is horrible. You can't possibly get through the snow on foot, and there's nothing else you can do. I'm no weakling. I have walked through snow many times and many miles before this. I am quite determined to go. Activity has been noticed among the British these past two days. I doubt that the sentries will honor your pass. They just better had honor it. If anything special is going on, they will be too busy to think about me. The pass is signed by General Howe himself, and I don't believe he will remember to cancel it. Father, can't you do something to stop her? The children are surely all right. If anything were wrong, Cousin John would have managed to get word to us. Anne, my dear, 
I have been married to your mother for many years. To date, I have been unable to think of anything to stop her when she makes up her mind. Frankly, I think it will take the British Army to do any stopping that can be done. She will start if she says so. I will start. I will start early in the morning, and you two will stay here and go about your usual work. I will be back before nightfall if it is at all possible. Let us not discuss the matter any further. Madam, it is impossible for anyone to leave the city today. I think not. There is no reason why I can't get out. I have a pass that permits me to visit my children. You have no orders to stop me. We have orders to stop everyone, Mum. Everyone but me, perhaps. General Howe himself made certain of that. He gave me this pass and has signed it himself. You have no orders higher than that. Well, says the general's signature, so I can't see anything else to do. Don't get off on the direct road, Mum. Today, that would be especially dangerous. I have only one reason to be going out this road. I do not care anything about your patrols. If my pass is not honored, the general himself will know about it. That should be the last patrol. Now, through the woods, toward the rising sun, and one of our patrols. This should be some of Colonel Craig's men. Hereabouts. Hey, woman ahead of us. Halt. Oh. Keep alert, men. I'll see what this means. Madam, this is a strange place for a woman to be traveling alone. I am looking for the American. Oh, you are Colonel Craig at last. I thought I would reach you. I am Lydia Dara. Mrs. Dara, what brings you into this dangerous territory? Colonel Craig, will you walk with me and listen to the news I have? There is no time to waste, I assure you. I will indeed. Spread out, men, and see that we are not interrupted. Now, Mrs. Dara. You must get word to General Washington at once. The British have planned that tonight... Lydia Dara returned to her home late in the afternoon. She explained nothing to her husband or daughter, and they, fully aware that strange things were in the making, did not ask questions. That evening, they listened fearfully to the British march away. All night and the next day, they waited. There were rumors of a battle. Late that evening, there was a knock at the door and Lydia opened to a British officer. Good evening. Madam, I wish to have a conference with you. With me? You precede me to the council room where we can be alone. Be seated, madam. This is a matter of great import. The news will be over town shortly, so I can tell you that today we fought a battle with Washington at Whitmarsh. You fought a battle? There wasn't much fighting. The important thing, madam, is that the enemy had notice of our coming. They knew the plans that were, we thought, completely and entirely our own secret. You mean they were ready? They knew and were prepared for us. We marched into a trap and came back again like a parcel of fools. These things do not just happen. You must be right. On the night of our last council meeting, were any of your family awake and around the house? Oh, no. I'm certain that they were in bed and asleep. I know that you were. I was the one who knocked on your door, and I had trouble enough getting you awake to lock up the house. I answered after I heard your knock. I know. But I almost broke my hand before you heard. I just don't understand. Well, it has been a sorry day for His Majesty's troops. What it may mean to Washington's men remains to be seen. There is nothing more I can do about it now. If we have need of your room again, we will let you know. Good night, madam. The room is at your disposal. Good night, sir. The story of Lydia Dara has become one of the legends of the American Revolution. Hers was the strength of character and patriotism 
that have always been and always will be the texture of American life. Happy Independence Day from Silver City Community Theatre Radio Hour. You are hearing this special programming on Gila Members Community Radio, KURU 89.1 FM, and online at gmcr.org. I'm Wendy Spurgeon, your hostess here with weekly radio theater entertainment, meticulously edited by Chris Bowman of Mystic Way Productions, and featuring the fresh, locally sourced talent of Silver City Community Theater. Join us next Sunday at four and we'll keep the party going because it's my birthday. We've got a very special birthday show for you that you won't want to miss. So happy 4th of July, friends. Stay safe, be happy, and see you next week. Bye for now.